I am Nina Johnson, and we're here with Jarrett Ernest and Ryan Johnson on the occasion of Ryan's first solo show, Dear Shadow, with the gallery. Jarrett is an extraordinary writer, curator, thinker, all around genius man who introduced me to Ryan's work many years ago um, and is always opening doors and paving directions for artists that haven't been, you know, highlighted in the mainstream. I think that's probably a fair way to say it. Um, Ryan is a sculptor based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, this is his first time showing with us at the gallery, and it's a new body of work that he's been developing for the past several years. Um, we're going to be looking at some images, and just so everyone's aware, we're recording this conversation, and it will be posted on our YouTube page. Um, so guys, I am going to open up the uh, images from the show, and then I'll let Jarrett and Ryan take it away. Um, wow. So Nina, are you going to just scroll, scroll through them? Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm going to start with the, these are the installation views, so I can kind of pluck through these, and then if there are specific works that you guys want to address, I can open those up. I think it would be, it would be really helpful to kind of see all the works that are in the show, just to like, get a full view and then we could sort of talk about them. Because how many are, are installed there? Six? There's five sculptures. Um, this is another thought. We'll click through. Here's a detail view. So you can get a little bit of sense of the surface. is leg after AG. Tangled figure, which I think is probably the most complex to read as an image. The gift. Oh, beautiful. And this is Wounded Bird. Hmm. Wow. So um, Nina, do you think we should start or did you wanna hang out for a minute or what was your vision? I think we can actually go ahead and start because we have quite a few participants that are here with us already. Um, and yeah, we're ready to rock and roll. Okay, so thank you, Nina. Thank you for inviting me to, to talk with Ryan. Um, while I have really liked him and his work for a long time, um, one of the, I, and we're, we're just not very far from each other physically in space right now, even though we're in different rooms, um, we've never really, taken the opportunity to have like a direct discussion about his work. So I'm really grateful that this show could occasion that. And I think the way that I would like to start is that looking at this set of five sculptures, they're so clearly um, a body of work, like conceived to be a piece and in dialogue with each other. And I'm wondering, Ryan, when you start, when you set about making this show or this group of sculptures, um, how do you how do you first begin? Is it about a feeling? Is it about a set of images? Is it about a material? Or is it is it even kind of like an, a language idea? Like how would you describe that process? Um, I feel like for this show, it was primarily the material. Um, it's the first time I've used this material like this, like making sculptures from scratch, basically with this material that's called epoxy clay. Um, so it took me a second to kind of figure out what it wanted to do and what 
images kind of worked with this material. Um, so I kind of feel like I followed its lead in a way. Like I had the head and the frog um, first, and then the wounded bird kind of happened, and then the other pieces filled out the group. Um, but it really, it's, I feel like it's, it's a bit of a, you know, um, I feel like you realize why you did things kind of after the fact in a way, like, I feel like you're kind of being led, like you basically need to just like show up to the studio and then these things are like, oh, now you should put a frog on the head and you know, you need to make this leg piece. And like, in the end you realize, you know, you did need that leg piece because it kind of made the group, you know? Um, yeah, I always love like Brancusi has this term, um, the, mo the mobile group, which is basically like the idea of individual sculptures that when together do something specific and different and, um, you know, hopefully something beyond just the individual sculptures. Um, I mean, basically an installation idea, but you're using, um, you know, just unique works. So this is born from my kind of material ignorance, but uh, epoxy clay, which I would imagine is some kind of plastic that, that is, uh, but is moldable. And, and so what is it that was unique? Like what are the opportunities that it opened up for you as like a process of making that were different than if it were a more traditional clay or the way that you had been kind of constructing uh, with various means before this? So this is the first time I've ever used anything. It's, I mean, it's basically clay, but when it sets, it kind of turns to stone. It's really dense. It's really heavy. It's very strong. It's a two part clay. So you mix, you know, part A, part B in equal amounts. And within three hours, it's like a rock basically. Um, so to work it after the fact, you're almost working on like a piece of marble. You know, you have files, sandpaper, it's, it's almost the same process. Um, but I was always terrified of clay. I'm not terrified, but um, it's, I feel like I wasn't ready for it until now because there's no friction with it. You know, you can do, it's like, there's nothing pushing against you. You know, like when you're carving something out of block of wood, like you, there's a comfort almost in that tension with the material that it's going to push back. But with clay, like this is completely additive. Like I can, I work it subtractively, but you can also like, if you go too far, I can like mix up another batch and like thicken it up and work it again. So, mm -hmm. um, like that quality about it where you really have to bring, um, you really have to know what you want because the material is not, you know, the material will do whatever you want to do. And it's almost like too easy, you know? So it's, it's, it's taken me a little while to figure out how to use it. So is there an interior armature? Um, there isn't, but like, for example, on this leg piece, there's a piece of steel that extends from the pedestal. Uh-huh. Slides in. And that's basically, I mean, for safety, it stands on its own, but I don't want it to fall on somebody. But also I want it to be exactly um, where I want it on the pedestal every time. <laughs> so someone couldn't set it up wrong. So I think one of the things about Brancusi as an artist, especially for sculpture, is he's the kind of person that you could just like, or thinking of objects and bodies and form, you could just like spend your entire life like obsessed with the moves that he made and trying to come to terms with them. And the thing about it that seems like emotionally or psychologically the most like poignant to me in Brancusi that I feel like is present in this show has to do with the relationship between like the whole and the part and like the body part that is a com that is complete like if it were a part of a human body it would not it would be like a kind of disturbingly severed thing it would be like a leg hacked off a body or a or a head cut off but as a sculpture as an object it isn't missing anything it's whole 
and it almost makes a performance of its of its completeness and i think that's what is so beautiful about that kind of um really extremely worked surface is it, it really shows you that like this has been um formed completely in in its kind of inner logic and so when you how do you relate to that that aspect of making sculptural objects that that are in dialogue with what might be recognized as body parts um Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's much easier. Like, I'm very happy with how these turned out. Actually, the first piece I ever tried to make with this material was um, an adolescent boy holding a baseball bat, which mm -hmm. I'm still working on. I started that like two years ago. And you realize how, like, the only full figure in this show is um, the Tangled figure, which is... Right pretty abstracted. Um, but I've admired a lot of artists you know, like Wilhelm Lembrook and Gaston Lachez and, you know, Maria Martins, like people who deal with like the full figure. I've admired these people for a long, long time. And I didn't appreciate fully um, maybe why until I tried to make a full figure basically out of clay. Um, because making it hold together as a whole is so incredibly complex and kind of addictive like it's like insane you know like you change a knee and then you have to change a shoulder and you you know what i mean like you add a half inch to the foot and you're like oh my god the back of the head looks wrong like it's so insane how intertwined everything is and you're also pushing up against you know thousands of years of you know, different kinds of stylization, which you can, you know, choose to embrace, or you have your own way of, you know, making the figure and exaggerating, you know, parts to make it have presence. Um, and, and I mean, it, it's a lot of fun, but in a way this show is kind of the most elemental. Like, I feel like I'm getting back to like the fundamentals of sculpture almost, you know. Mm -hmm feel like um like part of the most basic conversation you can have about sculpture in a good way you know um but it just gets so um fascinating and kind of subtle like when you're working like this and then realizing like you know like i think after the baseball boy one which isn't done i'm still working on it is um like you start to realize the power of like leaving information out you know and that comes back to brancusi where um you know like with that head it's like i wanted ears but not really you know so you kind of put ears and the head is the most imagistic of these um but i kind of want these to feel almost peripheral even though you're looking at them head on like i like that they might have a feeling of just kind of passing by or you know it's not really like they don't really notice you so much or something you know if that makes sense well then there's the added um dynamic there which has to do with the treatment of the surface with that dark color and kind of shine which really accentuates but also undermines the the curvature of the forms themselves and i imagine changes as you move around them in space as the lighting changes so, um, I mean, I don't know, like what the decision to make them this kind of dark, almost reflective surface, how did that influence the shapes themselves or the images? Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that really um, influenced them a lot. I mean, that's part of why I like the, um, the black epoxy clay. They, they make really strong silhouettes, which, you know, is always really important with sculpture. Like I almost feel when I think about sculpture, sometimes I think about it just as like an infinite set of silhouettes, you know, that you're trying to control or you're trying to make unfold in time somehow. Um, so I like that the black epoxy is um, graphic, like it's just like tonally intense, but like what you're saying with the sheen of black clay, like it almost, um, you know, you can almost feel like you see information and that's not there maybe like when you're walking around it and it kind of like plays into 
the the idea of these things almost being like dream objects where like it's not maybe quite enough information in some moments so you kind of have to you know maybe you kind of fill that in or you know i mean um but also i mean i made matte sculptures for years and years and like until i got into brancusi like i didn't realize that you know sculpture like one of prime the primary functions of sculpture is to catch and reflect light and you know for right. years and years i was making like i was trying to like absorb all the light and then i'm just like wait a second brancusi like oh yeah like if you polish something you you know it just it brings it to life like you can use light to reinforce your form like what am i doing like why am i trying to get rid of all the light that's like coming off these sculptures so i really think that it's like not an accident i mean i remember seeing the the boy playing with the baseball bat in your studio a couple times over the years and also every time being like wow this is amazing you're like it's not done and then like it's been like years of not being done i'm like wow this every time it looked really good um, and it was shown and whatever. But I think that there's something that's like not an accident about the subject matter of that sculpture and what you've been talking about, the problem of making like a whole body. And so I know this is kind of like a thing that artists don't really usually get asked and, and, we're, and in a sexist way, especially male artists don't usually get asked this, but like you have three small children. And I think that there's something that, I imagine there's something that makes you think about the body as an object differently when you're in proximity to like these little bodies in the way that they're like developing. So like, do you think that that in any way like altered the way you think about making these, these works? I mean, probably, you know, I mean, I feel like everything comes into play, you know, so obviously, having three kids is definitely going to come into play <laughs> um, just because it's such a major part of my life. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's weird about that baseball one because I feel like in the past I've been so easy to, like if I'm not happy with the way something's going, I have no problem abandoning a sculpture. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of sculptures that just I gave up on, you know, pretty quickly. So it's kind of comical to me that that baseball one is the one that I just keep going back to and I'm trying to figure it out. And I mean, I will, I'm getting, um, you know, it's getting closer. But the thing is, I think about it is I, it's, it's teaching me a lot like that piece. I'm learning a ton from that piece. And without that piece, like I couldn't have made this show, you know, like I learned a lot from even the failed attempts on that piece, even though it's been shown twice, which is like a complete nightmare to me. <laughs> And like I get it back to my studio and I'm like, oh my God, there's like 20 things glaringly wrong with this piece. Like, why was this shown? Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I continue to learn from that piece and um, like, I feel like I'm just kind of starting in this new world with this material. Do you think that one relates differently to a sculpture of a full figure? rather and like thus it's like harder to abandon than like an abstract shape i don't know i think it's pretty easy to abandon a figure because most you know most representational sculpture is pretty horrible you know it's not an easy thing to make good you know and that's like those people i mentioned that are can do it um it's almost like you know like the vision has to be so thorough that you accept it and it doesn't break apart when you start to notice like wait a second like you know from the knee to the foot is like nine feet long like why you know and to be able to pull off those moves where you can accept the expression of the thing even though the proportions are so off um it's like a weird like alchemy or something. Well, I also think that there's an aspect to human bodies that there's a lot of, of proportional things that are like structurally very awkward. And that when you, when you put them into a sculpture, the awkwardness becomes like extremely um, obvious. So it's almost like part of the problem of making figurative sculpture is to try and 
triumph over that in a way that doesn't that still is plausible as a um, as a figure. Yeah, and also it's like you have to you know set them in space because it's like you're dealing with you know space is like an active part of the process like there's um you know there's negative like in the same way you talk about negative space in like painting or drawing you know like sculptures even more so are set in space in that way where you're making negative shapes around it mm -hmm. you know? so you're trying to activate the space around it it's not just about the thing you're making um you know which I mean, the best example of that is like Giacomo Giacometti. It's like the reason why those look the way they do is because he was trying to point to the space around it. He's like, when I see somebody from like 10 feet away, the main thing I'm noticing is, you know, this enveloping space around them. So it's not like he set out to make like skinny figures, you know, for him, those are like realistic sculptures because they're pointing to space. Um, do you think one of the things I'm I'm really interested in is like people, regardless of what medium they're working in, when they have like an early moment where they feel like they have like a deeper insight into what a sculpture is, for instance, or like what a painting is. And so like I don't know, where would you like locate in your like life as an artist or as just a human being where you were kind of like it hit you, like volume, space, light, objectness that um you set you on your course? Um, I feel like just a couple years ago. I mean, I think I was always kind of aware of those things a little bit, but um, it, it's almost like um, the material thing kind of got in the way a little bit, not got in the way, um, but I feel like working with the clay has drastically changed um, the way I think about sculpture. And vol I mean, volume, it's insane. That is, it's such a learning curve because I feel like, um, yeah, like I think like something's done, like that tangled figure piece, like I'm like, oh, that's, you know, it's like I've, I worked on those legs for months and I would be convinced that like, oh, I totally have it right, you know? And then you come in the next day and like you add like 20 pounds of clay and you're like, oh, now it's better. You know, I mean, it's just, and you're like, I was, you know, I was three inches off on that profile. I'm like, how is that possible? Um, but it really becomes kind of addictive, like trying to get it to have presence, you know, and to, I mean, you're just kind of like trying to give these things life, um, but it's a big learning curve. <laughs> well, speaking of like learning curve, it makes me wonder about like your education and like when you came of age and when you were in art school, it seemed to me like the, the syntax of sculpture was very much about like accumulation. Like it was syntactical. It was like you put a thing in relationship to a thing in a space and it was like probably antithetical to the kind of of modeling sculpture that you're making now this kind of additive um, image based figurative sculpture in particular i'm sure that was an anathema to your art school education at columbia so what was that journey like for you like how did it, how did you relate to sculpture at that time and then how did you get from whatever you were being shown as sculpture to to arriving at this kind of like uh, making um i mean it's just been it's just been like a long process like the show i did before this was uh plywood that was glued together and then carved and you know i mean there's parts of that show that um you know they have a lot to do with these pieces but the surface I felt kind of distracting. Like once I kind of got those back from the show, I was unhappy with that. Um, but I mean, I've always really admired, you know, like I grew up in Indonesia and oceanic art has always been, you know, it's like my favorite wing at the Met. Um, I remember, you know, like Greek sculpture, like I've always, 
kind of liked a lot of like ancient, you know, I mean, Egyptian sculpture is obviously kind of like a touchstone with these pieces. Um, totally. Even in the material, like the black kind of granite polished like that. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, obviously a big influence. But I've always liked um, ancient sculpture and I've always liked the idea of um, just trying to pare things down, you know, as simple as they can be. So I feel like the process has kind of been trying to eliminate distractions from form and just trying to get to a form that I feel excited about, you know? And that's one of the things with this material is, I feel like it brings a lot to the table, but it also gets out of the way a little bit because you accept it, you're like, oh, it looks like sculpture. Yeah. Like he's polished like, or is that stone? You know, like there's a, a second of that, but it's kind of like, it's not, I don't think it defines the whole thing. It's like, oh, this is made out of, you know, kitty litter and tissues and you know what I mean? Like that's, yeah. not, that's not the conversation of it. You know, it's like, okay, it looks like sculpture. Like, is it interesting or not? Like, you know, just the form of the thing. Um, one of the things that I love about, thank you for, for directing the connection to like Egyptian sculpture. And one of the things that I really love about that sculpture and why I've, I've gone back to it so often, especially in the past few years, is much like Buddhist sculpture, it is not about verisimilitude and it's not about like um, any kind of life, like it's not going to move, you know, it, it's like every aspect of it as a sculpture emphasizes its staticness and it, it's like, I'm going to be really still forever. And like, also I happen to be a stone. And so that's what I'm good at doing. And so I, I think that there's something in that, that is, um, it lets those sculptures hold like almost a lot like psychologically or emotionally or in the case of Buddhist or Egyptian sculptures they can hold that spiritually but like by emphasizing the kind of the fact that they're not alive in a way it allows you to kind of animate them as a as someone responding to them as a body yeah I mean that's I I I find that like so fascinating and so kind of crucial to sculpture. It's like those, like the funerary objects that in Egyptian sculpture that like literally were supposed to be the thing. It's not like, um, you know, it's not like a representation of, you know, it's like, I just always imagine like the artisan being told what to do, you know, it's like, okay, make this little horse. I mean, probably not a horse for Egypt, but like, but it's like, you know, and it's like, okay, is it supposed to be a representation? It's like, no, 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 you're making like a horse like this. Yeah. You know, and that idea of like, you need to animate this inert material. It's so impossible. It's such like, like this wonderful impossible problem, but it's kind of the crux of sculpture in a way where you're like, how do you like breathe life into a completely inert material? And then like all the different strategies that people have come up with, you know, over, you know, thousands of years, um, but also that's been an impulse from the beginning, like that Werner Herzog movie, you know, with the cave painting, like so sophisticated, like it was all there, like the bow reliefs and you move, you know, there's multiple legs on the, you know, on the bison or whatever. I mean, it's just like um, the moves have been there from the beginning and the impulse, you know, like that need to kind of um, make material come alive. So there is an aspect, to this work that feels almost elegiac or or funerary and I mean do you is that something that you relate to or that you were dealing with consciously or do you think it, it it's like a product of the moment of like that we're living through I mean I was a, I was kind of surprised when we did the install Nina like how you know, like solemn it looks like it's feeling show that I feel like I've ever done, you know, they all seem very like interfacing, which, you know, definitely lines up with our moment culturally right now. Um, but I don't know, you know, if that was on per I mean, it wasn't on purpose, but I definitely noticed that feeling. 
I really liked I mean, the, like, what you said about um, the stillness, you know, like you, I just, it just was like so succinct and something that I've been like hovering around since the show opened. How do you put this into words that this thing is, yeah, it's stone. I mean, they're not stone, but like it's, it's sort of proud to be still and it's not asking, uh, it's holding its own space. And I think part of the the kind of like solemnity of the installation comes from that, you know. Um, somebody yesterday came and said something about, and then I'm gonna re-mute myself and not interrupt you guys, but they said something about uh, fairy tales, that there was something that felt a little bit um, like this very grim, but also fantastical presence in these. Do you think that's true, Ryan? Like, do you feel that a little bit with the with the frog and the bird? I mean, when I was like, I know, I feel like there's a aspect to it that's kind of like children's book-ish. Like if I just like write down literally what the subjects are, it's like, oh, this is a little bit like a children's book illustration or something. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think that's there um, for sure. But then also like with the frog, it's like, I also think of, you know, like that was pretty prominent in like ancient Egyptian sculpture. Um, and I like it just kind of as this symbol of like change, you know, it's like, it's always been the symbol of like changing seasons or some kind of shift or, you know, also like a symbol of fertility. Um, but I also just like that it is kind of, uh, you know, very connected to children in a way. Or I mean, I just have memories of like trying to catch frogs and you know that, I mean, this image is up right now, but like when you're, when you catch a frog and then you open your hand and then, you know, sometimes the frog jumps out immediately and sometimes it takes like 20 seconds, but it's, it's always just like this moment of anticipation, which is, I mean, it's always a good subject for a sculpture. Well, yeah, because the frog is just like, um, as a form, it's just like latent movement. It's just like, it doesn't actually have to do anything between being like little to just like disappearing because it's little, the, the structure of its legs. I mean, I have a question about the wounded bird sculpture, which is, which um, I don't know, for some reason I've been so attuned to noticing like, how many dead birds there are on like the sidewalk and in the park in New York. And one of the things that's so horrible about it is like, is how not, um, it's like, it, it's not a huge spectacle, right? It's like, oh, there's a, there's a dead bird. And also you, there's like, what, well, what am I supposed to do about it? You know what I mean? Like, other than like notice it, I guess, or, you know, and then I kind of go down, you know, there's like a, um, a Henry Green novel that starts with like a woman seeing a, um, a dead pigeon in a train station and then she like picks it up and like takes it into the bathroom and like wraps it in paper and then, and then what do you do? You know, it's like there are these sequence of things. It's like, okay, now what? And then she like puts it with her luggage, you know, it's like, and that's the beginning of the narrative. And so I, I, I guess that's all on my mind when I look at that sculpture and I wonder like, um, it's such a specific thing because it's not a dead bird, right? It's a wounded bird. So what, I don't know, how do you relate? To, I mean, and the form is so specific. So like, what were you really thinking about when you started making something that was like the quasi living sculpture or subject? I mean, I, I literally think uh, like a bird hit our window like a couple months before I started this piece. And it's like, I was, it was like the window uh, like on our front door. So it's like, I was leaving the house and it was almost like someone had put that bird right there. It was like perfectly perpendicular to our door. It was so weird looking, um, but just, it was so beautiful. Like it was, you know, and I wasn't quite sure if it was dead. So it's like, I kind of put it, off to the side in some grass, you know, and like, uh, um, I mean, not that literally that's what this piece is about. Um, right. But then I started making these wing forms. Um, but the wounded aspect to it, it's, you know, it also, you know, there's a bit of a metaphor just with sculpture generally, like, mm -hmm. like it's not dead, 
you know, it's not alive. Like, I mean, sculptures kind of exist in this in-between zone where, you know, like you're trying to, they're trying to do something to the room, you know, but it's very specific. Like they can't do that much. Like they can't, they're, you know, they can't hop off the pedestal. Yeah, they're kind of like a haunted materiality in their best form because it's like really a quasi subject. It's like you relate to it with that way. It's like almost like it's a person, but it's obviously not a person, but it's the product of some of a person's like intention and like, and I think that's one of the things that's so beautiful about the way these are made is that through the kind of intensity of, of attention, which is a kind of caring for it as an object, like bringing it into the world, um, you, you, you recognize the way in which like it's born of that kind of like um, being paid attention to both on the part of the, of the artist, but then on the part of the, of the person who's looking at it. Yeah. So the other thing, maybe this is like one of the last threads of conversation that I want to talk about, but I love people. The old, so first of all, as you sort of know about me a little bit, I get like bored very easily and I'm very impatient and bratty. And one of the workarounds I found for that is like if I'm at a dinner party, I realize that like no matter how boring other people may seem, they know a lot more about something than I do. And then I just have to figure out what that thing is and then get them to tell me about it. Because I love anyone who knows a lot about like something. So um, in the case of you, Ryan, I really think of you as kind of like a sculpture nerd in like the most loving way to the extent that like when you were doing your project where you were putting all this, the pictures of the sculptures on the shirts, and I just like want to know more about that. Like, what is it in like this deeper sense that just like, you know, you're, you know so much about sculpture and very obscure sculpture and you want to represent it and understand it in different ways. So can, can we like talk a little bit about your like sculpture nerdery? <laughs> I mean, I feel like it's just trying to learn mood. Like, I just want to know what everyone's tried and done before you know i think it's 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 more just like i love sculpture so i want to learn about it it's kind of you know and then in that you know process i feel like you become a better sculptor yourself because it's it's so much about learning and looking and seeing at new things and all that stuff ends up filtering into your own work um, like usually in my studio, I have a whole bunch of images like pasted up on the wall. Um, and this is kind of a temporary studio, so I don't have that here. Um, but I find that really helpful because you, you pick up on, on that stuff and you end up incorporating it in your own work without even knowing it, you know? And I feel like in the same way that like, you know, there's that quote, painting is painting's favorite food. It's like sculpture is the same way, you know, sculpture is sculpture's favorite food. Like sculpture wants other sculpture to feed it. You know, you metabolize the history of sculpture and like you make something with that, you know, like you are kind of, like when you're making a sculpture, you're also, you know, communing with like thousands and thousands of years of history. And, um, you know, that's part of the joy of it. Do you think that, I mean, be partly prompted by the, this, uh, the situation that we're currently in over Zoom, and like, I haven't gotten to see your show. I probably won't get to see most of these things in person, or at least not all together. And so um, one thing I've been wondering about is given your like deep study and interest in sculpture, are there sculptures that you have like, seen through images and thought like this is stupid I don't care about it and then when you saw it in person you were like wow I can't get over it and vice versa something that you thought like was stunning in an image and was a big letdown when you saw it in person and what what are those things <laughs> yeah I feel like I haven't had like the letdown experience um because <laughs> it's always better I mean 
I feel like you 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 learn something from it. Even like even if there is a bit of a letdown, it's not like oh man, I'm so bummed. It's kind of like oh, that's interesting. Like you know what I mean? Like that doesn't work like in real life. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, what's wild is I found out about this artist a couple years ago, Ivan Mestrovich. Um, like I ordered a, a monograph on him. Unbelievable artist, like one of the greatest sculpture sculptors that's ever been. Never heard of him before a couple years ago. It turns out he made a piece for the Catholic Church in Miami. And when I was down there installing, like I walked from the hotel and saw this, um, you know, Pieta sculpture. It's like, you know, 10 feet tall or something that had been recently refurbished there. Um, but totally unbelievable. Like it's, it's, and it's still, it's so wild to me that you can, you know, find out about these artists that you had never heard about, even though you're like actively seeking out like new things. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, there's this Croatian, like, you know, Michelangelo basically that existed, you know, he died in 1960 and like, you know, made hundreds and hundreds of like masterpieces. Um, you know, and I'm just finding out about that now. Yeah. The Croatian Michelangelo. He's an unbelievable. Yeah. Great work in Miami. <laughs> Did he live in Miami? No, but it's it's one of the only places in the United States you can see his work is here because the archdiocese just bought a bunch of that work in the 40s. <laughs> so part of me feels like you had this show like partly just so you could see that sculpture. I think that was- I didn't know it existed until Nina told me. Yeah, no, but I mean, that's the universe being like, uh, okay, here's the Croatian Michelangelo for you in Miami. So um, I would like to see if anyone else who's watching has any questions or comments that they would want to bring up into the into the space, the if digital space. If anyone has questions, you just need to unmute yourselves and then we can, uh, we will all be able to hear you. Everyone's always so shy. I have a question. I have a question. That's sort of a follow-up question. Um, wait, someone else said they have a question. Who is that? It's Haley. I just had a question about duration because I liked how Jared brought up the boy with the bat sculpture that I've also gotten the fortunate chance of seeing in Ryan's studio. And I like very much how Ryan considers works over time. And I, I guess I was a bit curious, Nina, and seeing how long these paint these sculptures were sort of worked over. You know, is this like a two-year duration or what was the process? Did some go more quickly? Um, did some have like sister sculptures that came before them? So it's mostly just time is my thought. Yeah, so the head one had been kicking around in the studio for like a year. So that was kind of the first one that was going. And when Nina came to the studio, the bird was also started. Um, but the group kind of came together like after the pandemic hit. Like it pretty much happened like this summer um, in terms of coming together as a show. But I really like working on things for a long time. The quickest one was the lead. Like that happened very quickly. Like I had the idea, I got the clay, I made it in the backyard in like a few hours and got a mold made of it, filled it with the epoxy clay, and it was kind of just like there. But I feel like the leg for me is almost just like the most basic sculpture that you can make. Like it's kind of the most fun and elemental, like elemental in a way. Like I feel like I've made legs for a long time. That's really interesting to hear Ryan because the leg to me looks so essential and simple and just really well put together. It, it's almost timeless. Like I could look at that and think, oh, maybe he rendered that at over 18 months or, and yet it also, because of the way the light is with it, it also looks as simple and clear as a sketch. So, but yet the material is so dense and so silent, so, so stable and sort of monumental that it does feel in a way timeless. Thanks for answering that. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Uh, Mary has a question. Go ahead. Yeah. 
I was just wondering how much sketching has to do with your process. Um, because you were talking about, well, if I add three inches, then, you know, the back of the head really needed changing. And so early on, how much are you sketching these out? I mean, some of these start as like cardboard sketches. Um, like the leg started that way, where it was like the shape was cut out of cardboard, like pretty close to what the final shape turned out to be. Um, but the sketches are just really thumbnails, just kind of ideas for them. Um, but when I was talking about like changing the head and stuff too, like that kind of applies to like the tangled figure one, like that one was the biggest, um, like went through the most change because I just did not know what that thing was supposed to be. Like it started out as like a kind of like almost like a dead insect looking man that would have been in like the new I images of man show or something at MoMA. Yeah. 40s, you know, like some very existential thing. And then it turned into a, you know, a more like, you know, um, voluminous woman with, you know, uh, massive amounts of hair and almost kind of turned into like this landscape. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi, hi Ryan. Hey, John. Um, you know, I, I appreciate everything you're saying about your kind of relationship to your loving relationship to the history of sculpture. Um, but I, I think it'd be really interesting to, for you to try and talk about, I think it's difficult, but I think that's the point, uh, a little bit more about subject matter in the sense of, I, I, I like what you said about Brancusi and reflectivity, but it makes me think about perfection. And I think there's an enormous emotional pressure involved with the whole idea of perfection, particularly of an object in space. And clearly you're making images that have an emotional resonance, the tangled figure, especially the wounded bird. But the idea that the surface is so perfect and the kind of relationship between that emotional pressure and let's call it more emotional resonance versus the perfection of the object through that very specific and particular surface. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no idea how to answer that. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I don't believe you actually, because I, I feel like, you know, you, you obviously you have a real life as an artist, you have a life as a father, a husband, as a friend. And I, I you know, I just think maybe if you can't talk about it in, in, in a more personal terms, but there's an enormous amount of time spent in just perfecting the surface as is. And how, how is that impacting the way that the work develops as meaning? Um, I don't know, but I do, I mean, I like, honestly, I'm not sure, but I, I know that I would be happy to work on one of these for like 10 years, you know, like if there was not a show involved, like I could absolutely happily polish a form like forever. So I, I don't know what that means for the work. I mean, it just says something about me, but. Well, it doesn't sound like pressure. Yeah, no, I mean, it's not pressure. I mean, I don't know what you mean by pressure exactly. Like I don't, um, I. Perfection is hard to achieve indeed. Yeah, but that's, yeah. I mean, I don't think about these in terms of perfection, um, but that makes sense that you're bringing that up because I mean, the surfaces are like super specific. I mean, when you're talking about polished surfaces, you know, everything shows, it's very, um, it's kind of a pleasant challenge though. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I guess I don't know what to say about perfection exactly. And Ryan, they're, they're flawed. I think it's funny because the difference between the image and the, the real thing, the surfaces in the images do look so perfect, but in real life, you've, there's a lot of detail, like some, cross hashing and some bubbles and and like your hand is more present in them than the images would make you think that's true yeah the images almost look very fried like when i first got the batch of images when i first 
saw the photos of these, I was like, uh, like it seems otherworldly. Like they look more perfect in images than they do um, in person. That's true. Maybe we'll take one more question. Oh, could I just add something to, oh, hi, I'm Victoria. Hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. Um, I, I guess just thinking about this idea of, of perfection or also or like folding it into meaning and I'm using my hands to like sort of folding, but I was also thinking of, or maybe this desire to keep working on something is that it's, or, and then referring back to this the idea of like um, funerary objects or sculptures being this sort of limbo in between living and, and you know and non-moving it's almost your there is and and in the work in this show it's like things like literally the birds wings folding and the tangled fig, fig, figure it's constantly like folding on itself and unfolding and maybe it's also like a wider in a way almost like a wider metaphor for making work and observing work is that it's constantly it, the form is i mean the stillness but it's constantly evolving and like you're you're still working and it's almost like this as you said, like addiction to the object and you keep, you keep working it, but then hence the meaning is constantly unfolding. I don't know, it's just, <laughs> just, but I was particularly thinking of that with the, with the tangled figure, because I feel like it's, it's almost the one, kind of the outlier in the show, it feels the most dynamic and it's, it's like so overlapping and, um, and bizarre and strange to figure out. And I feel like that's maybe one where it's, it's, it has those, constant layers of yeah folding unfolding anyways <laughs> um so it's, it's amazing to i mean amazing to see them all as a group and to hear this whole conversation i'm gonna mute again and say bye <laughs> thanks i think that's true we talked about that ryan that they're both like inward kind of turning in on themselves and also outstretching that both of those gestures are are definitely in the show yeah, for sure. Jared, do you have anything to say to, to wrap us out, to take us out of here? Um, I have a question and a comment. <laughs> uh, because no uh, public talk is complete without like a really uh, annoying, oblique angle question in the form of a comment. <laughs> but I think as I was like listening to this like discourse about like, the nature of finish and the investment in in like perfection and and like the kind of emotional or like libidinal location of that in the work i was thinking a lot more about how i feel like there's something that is very strange to try and come to terms with in what you're doing um, both in the way that they like their surface and the way that the surface relates to the form and that their kind of physical presence and then the relationship of that to an image. But I've, it has occurred to me a number of times that your work has a, like, a really strong sense of charisma. Like it almost, it has a kind of like a dark charisma or something that is, there's something that's very compelling about it. And in just like the way that like people, like there could be someone who's like not hot at all, but who's like extremely charismatic. And I kind of feel like that's sort of your sculptures. You know what I mean? Like there's something about them where you're like, I'm very attracted to the way that this is inhabiting the world, but it's like not ticking the boxes for me that I would usually like ascribe to like someone that I wanted to fuck or whatever. And so I wonder, and I think maybe part of that is just so innate. It's so much part of like how you, um, how you bring them into being and like the purpose that you see from them in the world. But I don't know, have you ever thought of like sculptures being charismatic or uncharismatic before? No, but I like that idea. Uh, I mean, that's not true. Like, I feel like, I do, I mean, when you were saying like, you know, my interest in like, um, maybe like lesser known sculpture, kind of like tertiary figures or something, like I feel like I am attracted um, to work that is kind of like off in some way maybe, you know, that maybe, um, and does have charisma, like in its like, like weirdness, you know, like it doesn't fit into like a main 
like the main narrative or something. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of kind of, you know, quirky representational sculpture that fits that bill in a way, you know. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, I feel like I do. I have thought about charisma, but I mean, of course, that's impossible to think about. Like, you know, if you're ma making work or think about for yourself, you know, like that's not part of the process. Right. So there's so many fabulous. I didn't realize until the end that there were so many fabulous people that were present silently. But I was like, hi, everyone. Congratulations, Ryan. Thank you, thank you Nina. Thank you both so thank much, you. Jared. Truly, thank you for taking time on Saturday morning. And Ryan, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone who joined us and, and participated and asked questions. The show is up until the middle of November. And there's images on our website, um, ninajohnson.com. And if you have any questions, just reach out to us. We're happy to share additional views. If you're in Miami, send us an email and we'll schedule a time for you to come see it in person. Thank you both. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So interesting. Thanks.